Good afternoon and uh, good morning, depending where you are in China or in Europe. Uh, you are watching a live uh, vi vi virtual seminar, The Year of Europe on Whole, Among a, a Pandemic, Perspectives on European Integration and China-Europe Europe Cooperation. Uh, this webinar is hosted by Center for China and the Globalization. Uh, I'm uh, Hui Yao Wang, President of Center for China and Globalization, and we're delighted to uh, uh, chair this uh, section. So this program actually is the ninth edition of CCG China and Globalization in a Time of Coronavirus webinar. Uh, th this series has launched in March, uh, having brought to the audience of a dialogue to exchange uh, among the prominent experts, scholars, uh, policy advisors, stakeholders, and practitioners from China around the world. On the Concerning the urgent issues and also, of course, the impacting uh, uh, on, on, on this uh, ongoing global crisis. So 2020 should be, have been a, a, a very productive year for um, the Europe uh, project and EU-China relations. And uh, uh, this European Union began the year reinvigorated, having weathered the threat of a free accident and also, of course, forward to an ambitious agenda. Uh, on climate change and the economy, whereas uh, China uh, also uh, has doubled down on its relation with uh, European countries, with key gatherings in, uh, uh, in uh, 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 of course, there was a planned uh, summit uh, in Germany uh, uh, in September this year. Of course, with this coronavirus, uh, this has been uh, uh, impacted. So, uh, so we, what we hope to do is that uh, this actually, uh, uh, the coronavirus has actually um, you know, uh, already uh, caused uh, uh, the whole world uh, shut down almost, and uh, you know that uh, toppled uh, 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 two six million uh, affected cases worldwide, and uh, so uh, we see some high uh, uh, casualties in the, in the Europe as well. So it's an, it's an international health crisis, and also it's an enormous social and economic um, uh, fallout. Uh, put the, the, the Europe and China and the rest of the world in a very, uh, very difficult situation. So, so what what this impact going to be have on the uh, uh, global economy? It's on the globalization uh, uh, process, of course, and also on the, on European countries, on China, and on the uh, you know U.S., China, and and many other countries on the trade, on the on the economy rec recovery and. Uh, how we can, you know, get out of this crisis and how we can better uh, going forward uh, to to really uh, uh, make a very good uh, uh, re comeback on this. So uh, for for that, uh, you know, today we're actually joined by a group of very distinguished uh, uh, panelists uh, from uh, China and European uh, countries. Uh, I, let me uh, just uh, introduce our. our, our uh, guest uh, panelist, uh, distinguished panelist, uh, join us today. So we have, uh, according to this uh, alphabetic order, Mr. John Christopher Barr, Chief Executive Officer and Executive Board Chairman, Dialogue of Civilization Research Institute, based in Berlin. And Dr. Trey Hongjian, he's a Senior Research Fellow and Director of the Department for European Studies, China Institute of International Studies, which affiliated with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and he's also a non-resident senior fellow of uh, CCG. We have uh, Ms. Sarah Machata, a state representative, European Chamber of Commerce in China. We have a uh, Professor Paolo Mark Murray. He's the executive vice president and director, Italian Institute for International Politics Studies. We have uh, Mr. Alistair Michi. He's a secretary general, British East Asia Council, and he's also executive chairman of UK-China Business Leader Confederation. We have uh, Mr. Ming Hao. He's a founder, chairman, and CEO of uh, Nanjing Earth House Electric Limited. He's a senior CCG council member. Uh, also, um, um, Alistair is our CCG international uh, uh, chair as well. And we have uh, Dr. Francis Nicholas, She's a senior research fellow and director for Center oh. Asia Studies at French Institute of International Affairs and oh. International Relations, based in Paris. And of course, we have uh, Dr. Justin Vassin. He's the director general at Paris Peace Forum, 
and he's also had a long uh, uh, serving uh, with the French government uh, uh, in the foreign affairs arena. We have also Professor Zhang Daojun. He's a professor of international e political economy, Peking University, and he's a CCG expert advisor. So we have all the uh, great uh, uh, panelists actually we gathered here today. And uh, so this is a, a, a live uh, discussion. And uh, so I, I would like to uh, uh, open this and uh, we'll have a, a first round about probably uh, six minutes and, uh, and then we have a second round about three minutes and then we have some final uh, uh, question and answers, uh, Q&A. So uh, I, I'd like to first uh, invite uh, Dr. Justin Vassin, he's a, a director general of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the uh, Paris Peaceful. And we know Paris Peaceful is a really a great, uh, 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 big uh, uh, forum actually established by French President Macron. And uh, this forum actually is, uh, is, has a great impact now and has been running for two years in a row. And uh, uh, so that uh, uh, Paris Peace Forum is, is also now become a global governance uh, a platform uh, in, uh, in Europe and also impact in the world. And uh, so that uh, we really uh, want to hear uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Vassin, you know, from uh, from Paris Peace Forum point of view, and also from the European point of view, and particularly you also based in uh, in France. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Vassin also served as a director of research uh, for the Center of the United States and Europe, and also as a senior fellow uh, uh, at the Brookings. Uh, Institute at the Foreign Policy uh, Department. So, uh, Justin, you, 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 can you start? Thank you, Henry, and uh, I think this is a great uh, time for holding such a discussion, uh, precisely because we uh, not only face an exceptional uh, context and exceptional challenges, but also because China-Europe relations are uh, strained and, and we should uh, uh, try, uh, you know, to do whatever we can do, think tanks and experts to uh, uh, do something uh, about it. Perhaps I could uh, take a step back and, and, and look at how the, the, the international community is responding to this before getting to China-Europe uh, relations. You know, a few points. Uh, first, this is a dramatic confirmation that we are interdependent. I don't need to uh, elaborate on this uh, from trade to data. We are all interlinked by many, many ties. And of course, viruses are one of them. Uh, the second point is that this, of course, uh, is a contradiction of the message that many populist leaders have been putting forward. You know, my country first. Uh, that uh, doesn't work in a world that is interdependent. And so uh, anything that attacks the work of the international community to better organize, better regulate, uh, etc., goes against the interest of uh, the group uh, in, in, uh, in general. Um, the third point is to try to assess how we've done so far, and I'm not uh, uh, giving grades to any to any country, but rather to the community uh, as a whole. And the truth is, we've not been doing uh, very well uh, uh, at all. What we've seen uh, from the beginning of the uh, pandemic uh, is countries closing borders with no coordination uh, and little notice. Uh, countries appropriating medical material, especially masks, by uh, you know all means uh, possible. Of course, there has been some uh, uh, deliveries, etc. But the first reflex, uh, reflex that we could uh, anticipate, was of course to get material for their own uh, population. As far as international organizations are concerned, the UN Security Council did not convene uh, for three months, uh, and neither the G7 or the G20 have been particularly, uh, 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 you know. Uh, wonders uh, in the current uh, uh, situation. Uh, to continue on that uh, vein, uh, I must say that the two most uh, powerful uh, uh, nations, uh, China and the US, have been underwhelming uh, in their, uh, uh, let's say, ability to provide leadership uh, and champion the multilateral uh, response. Uh, instead, what we saw, uh, from Europe at least, was a battle of narratives uh, exchanging barbs, uh, etc., which probably has contributed to weakening the collective uh, response uh, to the uh, coronavirus. Uh, even though we know that we need that, no country will be safe until all countries are safe, simply because that's the reality of um, interdependence and, and globalization. 
uh, no country will be safe for a long time before a vaccine has been found and, and distributed. And so for that, we need collective efforts, we need public and private efforts, we need coordination, uh, uh, etc. So, um, is there a silver lining in all of this? That is, are there good news uh, uh, among uh, uh, this uh, landscape, uh, which is not, uh, which doesn't uh, uh, provide a lot of reasons for uh, optimism? Well, first of all, if we take a step back, uh, we should remember that the great catastrophes of uh, the 20th century, World War One, and have been um, uh, have been uh, uh, followed. Uh, by a reshuffle uh, of the uh, uh, international institutions uh, in the sense that uh, uh, what, what we saw uh, not very convincingly after World War I and much uh, better after World War II was a reshaping of international institutions. Of course, there's no assurance that uh, the coronavirus crisis will be followed by such reshuffling. Uh, however, uh, because of the needs, because of the magnitude of what we're uh, going through, uh, it is quite possible that we might see uh, at least uh, some changes and some better coordination. One thing that we should take a particular, uh, uh, we should give particular attention uh, to uh, is what I would call vertical multilateralism. That is not only among the more or less 200 countries uh, forming the uh, international community, but also uh, all of these efforts that associate uh, foundations, the private sector, citizens, NGOs, and others uh, around common goals. And that's really important. Let me give you an example. Um, you know, perhaps most of the viewers have never heard of uh, Gavi, of the Global Fund, of UNITED, or CEPI. But these are all initiatives that are associate countries with international organizations with um, the private sector to provide either for medicines, uh, that's for UNITED, or for vaccines, that's GAVI. For CEPI, CEPI is doing uh, research. Uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, of course, the Global Fund uh, for AID has been uh, redirecting its efforts towards, uh, towards uh, coronavirus. And so all of these... Uh, you know, whether it's the uh, Gates Foundation or uh, WHO uh, or some other, uh, some other actors like private actors have been banding together. What we need uh, here is a reinforcement of this and better coordination of all of these uh, efforts if we want to get out of this quickly and uh, more or less uh, united. And that's what we've been trying to do at the Paris Peace Forum uh, with your help, uh, Henry, and the Center for China and Globalization uh, for the last two years is to gather all the actors of global governance and try to counter the degradation of multilateralism and the degradation of collective action uh, in the face of greater challenges. The, the paradox, trying to answer the paradox that we have more and more global challenges like coronavirus and less and less a collective ability to, to deal with it. So we are preparing the third edition of the Paris Peace Forum uh, in November. Uh, and uh, there will be uh, heads of state, dozens of heads of states and uh, others, depending, of course, on the sanitary conditions, uh, gathering in order to try to build this vertical multilateralism for vaccines, for better resilience, and also for trying to build uh, a better world after we've gone out of this crisis. Over to you, Henri. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And uh, uh, you made a very good uh, opening uh, remark. I think that... Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. I think, uh, you know, now we are facing a, a global uh, uh, challenges and whereas we need a global uh, governance. The global governance is falling behind global uh, reality now. And uh, so you're right, like like UN, we haven't been called the uh, National Security Council, hasn't had a meeting uh, for quite some time. And of course, we had a G20 uh, one time. Uh, but uh, but the nationalism, populism is, is impacting us. And uh, so this global coordination and uh, global uh, multilateralism, um, I, I think, is the, probably most important. Uh, you're, you're, you're right. No, there's no, no country is safe until uh, every country is safe. So, so absolutely correct. So, so this is really good, good, uh, good uh, to know that uh, Paris Peace Forum is still carrying this uh, global, global, global <laughs> multilateralism, and uh, and we, we definitely want to continue that. Uh, so, uh, thank you again for your for your, for your great comments. Uh, now I would like to uh, have uh, Mr. Chui, uh, Chui Hongjian. Uh, he's a senior fellow of uh, director for the uh, Department of European Studies. 
Chan Institute for International Studies and also a now resident senior fellow uh, at uh, uh, CCG. So, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Trey has, uh, has uh, uh, been really uh, very experienced in the European affairs and has been uh, in this area of uh, research leading this for, for a long time. He's also a frequent commentator uh, on European affairs. So maybe, uh, uh, Professor Trey, uh, your, your, uh, your comment uh, would like to hear. Okay, thank you so much, Chair, and especially uh, thanks to the uh, organizers, uh, not only the CCG and also our European uh, colleagues. Uh, anyway, it's a very special, I mean, <laughs> uh, vocation. We can have this, um, you know, exchange online. Especially, I would like to say hello to my uh, uh, old friends, Nicola uh, and also director from the ESP. And uh, indeed, as we uh, understand, I agree with uh, totally uh, the remarks from our uh, European uh, friend. How about this, um, uh, you know, maybe a kind of uh, firstly suffering uh, both to China and Europe uh, for this uh, coronavirus, and also at the same time, how could we do something more uh, to deal with this uh, common uh, I mean, challenge? Uh, but of course, now I, I just want to uh, share some uh, maybe points of mine uh, related to this issue. I think firstly, uh, I agree with uh, uh, the gentleman totally that uh, now we suffered a lot, not only from this, uh, uh, I mean, suffering uh, physically, and now we also, uh, uh, you know, trying to dealing with this uh, any, uh, you know, damage uh, uh, economically, uh, especially if we uh, take a look at this uh, uh, statistic from IMF uh, for maybe the first quarter of this, this year, uh, we suffered a lot. I mean, both China and Europe, from this, uh, uh, you know, impact of uh, uh, coronavirus on uh, economy, trade, investment, especially I think from a uh, European, uh, you know, uh, 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 side that uh, I got the, uh, uh, you know, data is roughly for the first court of this uh, this year, uh, nearly I mean, twenty billion uh, euro. I mean, uh, the lost uh, loss from. Uh, uh, European side because of the pause of the uh, you know supply chain between China and uh, Europe, and also between uh, Europe and the uh, uh, United States. So I think it gives a very very uh, I mean a deep impression that how could we uh, try to uh, do something more to help this uh, stability of uh, supply chain and also value chain like that. And also the secondly is now. Uh, we are trying to, uh, you know, avoid any kind of uh, further uh, damage from this uh, uh, epidemic uh, uh, disease on not only e economy and also society and also even the uh, politics itself. And also we can find out more uh, maybe problems now uh, for European side. Uh, if we look at uh, now what happened between the refugee issue and also some uh, uh, you know, uh, coronavirus uh, 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 issue and some other. And of course, at the same time, the, how about the political change or political trend? If we look at this um, uh, so-called populist uh, uh, issue now uh, within Europe. So I think that now uh, more and more, uh, it will give us more, uh, how to say, momentum for China and Europe to do something more together. But of course, I think now uh, certainly I would like to say that uh, it's it's also a very big test for China and Europe. How could we to, uh, you know, uh, give us some more uh, positive perceptions with each other? Because as we know, during this uh, very very special time, especially when this uh, uh, epidemic, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, spreading, always there will be some more. Just like uh, uh, stressed by our European friend, is a miss information and disinformation. I think China suffered a lot also from this uh, uh, very, very, uh, I mean, uh, difficult issue. And how could we do something? Uh, if we look back uh, a little bit to the, uh, uh, for example, last year, I think a very, very major uh, uh, effort for China and Europe is how could we try to, uh, you know, uh, promote these uh, mutual perceptions? How could we try to get some more mutual understanding because we uh, started to recognize that, uh, yes, now we are very, very good uh, trade and investment partner. 
But at the same time, we have to deal with some more and more issue for mutual confidence or mutual trust. Once we could not get some more mutual trust, I think there, there will be a very, very narrow space for us to achieve more or further in economic and trade and so on. But of course, unfortunately, I think the recent uh, uh, days, especially during the very specific uh, time, uh, we are suffering some problem. And uh, especially, I think maybe one uh, reason is at the very beginning for both the sides, for uh, European side, for Chinese side, uh, we do have some problem on how to, you know, recognize or how to estimate with each other on this, uh, for example, uh, the measures or the policies or responses to this uh, coronavirus. Uh, if we look at the, uh, you know, some uh, European media at the very beginning, uh, regarding to some, uh, you know, Chinese uh, situation, uh, for example, uh, in uh, January, we can find uh, some, maybe, uh, uh, maybe some uh, uh, misjudged uh, uh, duties from uh, European media. And of course, at the same time, I mean, uh, when China get a better situation and when uh, European become another uh, epidemic center, I think from Chinese, especially uh, the website or internet, you can find some, uh, I mean, I, I, I would like to say a very, very wrong or misinformation about Europe. So I think it gives us a very big challenge for us, especially for uh, think tanks, for uh, experts, for scholars. How could, we try, how could we try to help our people, our public opinion, to understand a real situation uh, uh, for each other? Especially, how could we explain uh, what's the uh, uh, real reason for some uh, European countries? They will not, they could not do the same thing like the Chinese government. Of course, as we turn that in China, we also could not do the same thing uh, like what happened in Europe. So I think it gives us a... Um, I mean, uh, opportunity to go back to this uh, very, very, I mean, original points for our mutual understanding or mutual perception is we are different, but we should respect with each other. The difference will not be any reason to deny with each other. So I think that would be a very, very important issue and key issue for us. Once we try to talk about more, how could we, you know, restart our cooperation or coordination after the, uh, you know, uh, coronavirus. So I think maybe finally, uh, what I would like to say that uh, how could we find out, out our role for China and Europe uh, to play after the, uh, 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 you know, this is. I think firstly, uh, undoubtedly, the multilateral cooperation would be a very, very important uh, thing. We need to insist together. We need to uphold it together. As we can find out now, it gives uh, give us a very, very big challenge uh, during the, uh, uh, you know, sufferings. Firstly, how about the more and more, uh, you know, unilateral behaviors, okay? I don't want to mention some countries. And also some problem is, it gives uh, give us a very big evidence, the lack of the uh, global governance in the global, uh, in the public health uh, uh, field. So how could we, China and the Europe and some other countries we need to do after this, um, uh, you know, coronavirus, besides the climate change issue? If we try to, you know, uh, 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 try to find out more space for this uh, public health, uh, uh, you know, uh, governance to be another very, very potential uh, field for China and Europe, we can do something. more. And the secondly, how could we try to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, to keep this uh, uh, globalization, okay? So now there are more and more pessimistic, uh, 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 you know, opinions about it, say that, okay, the globalization will will go to end and uh, the, the coronavirus uh, killed uh, the uh, globalization. I don't agree uh, with it. Anyway, but uh, yes, we need to have some more reforms on the current uh, globalization. But uh, there will not be any condition or any uh, reason to uh, refuse uh, the uh, uh, globalization. We should, we could not go back uh, to to the you know to the past. 
So I think that, that will be very, very important thing for China and Europe. Because now uh, we do have a very high in interdependency, uh, not only on the uh, value chain and supply chain. So I think mm -hmm. that will be very, very uh, important thing for us. And uh, finally is, uh, just like I mentioned uh, before, is it gives us a very, very big a warning that now it's time for us to go back to the very, very uh, basic point is how could we try to find some uh, common points or common understanding uh, once we try to go further. And uh, we need to uh, indeed to help not only Chinese people and European people to understand more that yes, just like I mentioned, we are different, but uh, we do have a more and more uh, common interests and also common goals. So yes, uh, uh, now uh, still, I think uh, uh, because we are still in the uh, uh, you know uh, epidemic uh, disease, so we try to do something more, and also we try to think about uh, something more. But uh, I think that now it's a very very good time for us to restart our uh, uh, common efforts. I should stop here. Thank you. Okay. Thank thank you thank you uh, Hong Jian and. Uh, um, I think that uh, you're, you're right, you know, we really need to promote more understanding and more, uh, you know, particularly among uh, China and, the, and, and our European friends. And then, you know, during this uh, pandemic crisis, we, all the countries should work together and then we, uh, we should uh, all uh, look for uh, ways to collaborate. I think European countries, EU has been uh, always China's uh, one of the largest trading partners. So. Uh, there's many ways that we our, our hearts goes out to to the European uh, friends who are now fighting the coronavirus, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, we we all come out uh, uh, successfully together, and uh, we are really in the same boat. Uh, I, I know uh, John Christopher, you know you you have something uh, going up later, but perhaps uh, uh, John Christopher, uh, you can also uh, uh, speak next. And uh, uh, I know that you are the chief executive officer of Dialogue of Civilization. Research is based in Berlin and uh, uh, also uh, have a lot of research and, and things like that. And uh, you, you've been previously served as a head of a strategy and development at the United Nations Alliance for Civilization and also head of a policy dialogue at the World Bank and many other posts. So perhaps, uh, uh, John Christopher, can you uh, share uh, your views? I will, you know, we, we, we'll keep that at six minutes. Thank you, Henry, and good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot to you, Henry, and the CCG for taking the initiative to organize this uh, very timely conversation. We were just two days ago uh, together in a seminar, in a webinar organized by uh, the Dialogue of Civilization Institute, which was discussing, you know, the geopolitical um, consequences uh, of uh, the crisis. So, in a way, the discussion goes on. And uh, um, even so, I speak from... Uh, Berlin, I cannot speak from a German perspective, uh, you know, because Dialogue of Civilization Institute is an international think tank that happens to be based in Berlin. Uh, but in a way, our goal and the way we portray ourselves is really to be uh, a multilateral think tank, which is quite unusual, uh, with the goal to promote shared worldview. So um, I would really, I mean, focus my comment on this perspective in trying to promote those shared worldviews in the context where we are. Evidently, what we are witnessing today um, is um, lots of talks and lots of, in a way, speculation about what we could call eventually the crisis behind the crisis, um, you know, with some sort of a domino effect, is that the sanitary crisis would generate an economic crisis that would generate itself a geopolitical crisis. Uh, or eventually an acceleration uh, of um, uh, the reshuffling uh, uh, of the so-called world order. Um, in a way, it's interesting to see that one of the last major sort of world rendezvous uh, that took place before, you know, we went in this lockdown uh, was the Munich Security Conference um, uh, in February uh, with this sort of... Uh, unexpected development or talks about this uh, notion of westlessness and also with an evidence, um, uh, let's say, affirmation or expression of the growing tension or the, the emergence of a bipolar 
uh, a tension between the US and Europe. Uh, in, a, in a way, the story has stopped you know, a, a little bit at that time, you know, because of the, the crisis. But uh, evidently, for those you know, who were in Munich or those who have been really following very closely, um, this was not a turning point, but an evidence that we were heading towards um, um, a, a much more bipolar uh, world. And, and uh, um, there are lots of views, and um, probably many of you have read this uh, very interesting piece from jo Joseph Nye uh, that was published in Foreign Affairs uh, a few days ago, uh, which was taking a stand to say, well, no, uh, the coronavirus will not change the global order, um, and um, um, it will have no real major impact. And uh, um, speaking also from, let's say, a French perspective, there was a very interesting interview from the, uh, the, the French Foreign Affairs Minister, Jean-Louis Le Drian, when we, he was asked, you know, how do you think the, the post-coronavirus uh, world order would look like? He said it, it, would, like, uh, it would look like the the world before, but in even much worse, uh, in, in worse. So, I mean, uh, I think there are lots of speculation um, and um, probably very difficult to anticipate what will be, in a way, if there will be some sort of this cascading effect, sanitary crisis, economic crisis, geopolitical crisis. Uh, so I would, uh, I mean, keep uh, a very uh, uh, prudent uh, with this, but uh, we don't have a crystal ball, but what we see for sure, and it, I think it was stressed by uh, uh, the previous uh, speakers, and, uh, is that we are witnessing uh, lots of nervousness, um, that, uh, and we see some sort of week after week an escalation of this sort of blame game, uh, fingers pointing, um, when it comes to uh, uh, discussing or developing a controversy about the root chain of the pandemic, uh, about uh, the virtues of uh, the political system that are uh, uh, able to cope uh, with the pandemic in an effective way and to say, you know, you see our political system uh, is much more uh, effective to handle those crises. Uh, and again, I mean, this is creating some sort of a frustration and tension. Uh, when it comes to the denouncing of what we could call the, the mask diplomacy, um, um, uh, Justin Weiss, you know, who is also with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, can tell you also that uh, just a few days ago, um, uh, the minister uh, called the Chinese ambassador uh, uh, because uh, there were some comments that were considered unpleasant. So I, in a way, uh, you know, it's a bit like kids in the courtyard uh, that are uh, denouncing each other for misbehaving. Um, um, there were lots of talks of speculation about uh, the end. Uh, will it be the, the end of the era of globalization? There's this war. I mean, uh, um, Joseph Borrell, uh, the EU High Representative on Foreign Affairs, uh, denounced this uh, uh, war on narrative. Um, um, there is lots of also speculation that... Um, each other are trying to take advantage of this crisis to promote uh, their own uh, vision or interest. I think, I would say this is not interesting. This is not at the level of uh, the magnitude of the problem that we have to handle and to cope uh, with. And I think it is very urgent uh, that, uh, you know, by all means, we avoid those sort of escalation because it, can, it could really lead us uh, to a major crisis. We have mentioned, uh, or it is common to mention, you know, the reference to World War II, World War I, uh, some sort of a, a, a decisive turning point in the history of humanity. Um, I don't know in reality if we are there, but what I think is important, um, and when it comes to really the topic of our seminar today, which is really the relation between Europe and China, uh, I see a tremendous window of opportunity to uh, move from words to action, or from words to concrete commitments. Um, in the aftermath of 
the war and particularly World War II, uh, you know, there was what we call this Bretton Woods moment, where, you know, all the belligerents uh, came together, or the allies came together, and there was a vision, and there was a leadership. And I think this is what is needed today. This is a, a unique moment for a few leaders to show or to demonstrate their capacity to overcome this crisis and in a way to take some distance uh, with uh, the little blame game that is certainly not what we is needed today. 2020 is the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Next week, in a way, you know, there were lots of grand plans in Europe to have major events to celebrate this anniversary. It is also the 75th anniversary of the creation of the United Nations. And it is the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. And I think this is a unique moment in time. In September, there will be, um, you know, the, or at least this was what was planned, a major heads of state summit with, um, the goal to promote a UN declaration with the, all the heads of states on the future of international cooperation. Evidently, the time has come to acknowledge the failure or the weaknesses of our existing international architecture. We should certainly not, you know, deny uh, those weaknesses. Uh, in a way, this crisis has demonstrated that. Uh, uh, there were serious weaknesses uh, in uh, the architecture itself, but also the nature of the international cooperation, which is still a resurgence of the Westphalian system uh, that is entirely led by government. Um, maybe there is a unique moment in time. Someone was telling a few days ago about a new call or for a new internationalism. Um, maybe I'm too naive, uh, but I think it is a, mo a moment where we need to explain and mobilize, and this is why we need at this point in time a very strong and visionary leadership uh, from uh, the very few world leaders really to mm -hmm. go and to, to, the, you know, to, to try to think about a new system that would work uh, 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 for all, and that would uh, avoid uh, the risk of uh, of tension. I'd like to add one other point when it comes to the EU and China cooperation, um, where we need to give evidence um, of a goodwill or willingness to cooperate. Um, there are also lots of speculation of fear that one of the next uh, outbreak of the crisis will be in Africa. And I think uh, we need to be able to show that we are able to cooperate to prevent this crisis and not really to uh, develop some sort of parallel and competing uh, 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 sort of support. Um, I think it is time, in other words, you know, to, to move from words to concrete evidence of our willingness to cooperate. Um, and my last point would be to say that uh, there is a rising anxiety or rising fear here in Europe about the way this new world order will evolve. Uh, is it going to be uh, this sort of the battle of the giants uh, between the US and China uh, and where we as European uh, will have to position ourselves um, and be some sort of a, a minor player um, and, and I think, you know, there's a window of opportunity to create a real conversation uh, on what we want to do, what are the common values. Um, and um, there is an aspiration, uh, as you know, from the new uh, EU leadership uh, that expressed when they took over Madame van der Leyen and uh, Joseph Borrell uh, to make uh, the EU a much more assertive um, foreign or international player. Uh, so um, I think we should really size this opportunity. 
to look at how uh, uh, um, you know we could create, but not just through talks, but through concrete sign of evidence of a willingness to collaborate. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, John Christopher. And uh, uh, you're right. I think you have shared many uh, points as well. Uh, I, I agree with you that I think the world now need uh, strong leadership and. Uh, that's where G20, that's where I think uh, EU, China, uh, and US, of course, uh, should really, you know, as the two, three largest uh, economy uh, should uh, really get together. And particularly the UN system should be strengthened, I mean, with also WHO uh, should be strengthened as well. Uh, you know, we should really avoid uh, fingerprinting and uh, finger pointing and, and also, of course, conspiracy theory and things, things like that. So I absolutely agree that multilateralism should be strengthened. Uh, now, I'd like to have also another uh, European friend. I mean, we know that uh, Italy has been really uh, suffered uh, quite heavily uh, during this pandemic uh, crisis. And uh, we have actually also invited uh, uh, Dr. Paolo uh, uh, Mari, and he's the executive vice president and director of the Italian Institute for International Political Studies. And he's also a professor of international relations at the Bocconi University and also a senior government advisor, serving as a member of a strategic committee of the Italian Minister for Foreign Affairs and a member of the European Policy Group and also World Economic Forum and, uh, and also a member of the board of director of the Italian China Foundation and, and the secretary of the Italian group of the Trilateral Commission. So you have many uh, impressive titles. So, um, may, Paolo, uh, you know, we had actually... Uh, you chaired uh, a section of the Global Think Tank, uh, uh, you know, uh, web uh, just not too long ago. We were at the same panel. So, so I'd like to hear you again, uh, your, your, uh, your thoughts as well. Um, Paulo? Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I was prepared to say a few words on Italy, but uh, I think that uh, considering what other people commented so far, and in particular, particular what uh, uh, Jean-Christophe just said, I will move uh, on uh, the other topic, which is uh, uh, working together, international cooperation and uh, China-Europe, if you allow me. Can you mm -hmm. hear me? Sure, we can hear you very well. Yeah. So, uh, uh, point number one, uh, let's be very realistic. Uh, I fear we will experience more division among countries before we manage to see more cooperation in the near future. I expect more division on borders, travel restriction, medical procurement, trade, international cooperation in general, and international organization. Uh, I think, to be realistic, we will experience some kind of state distancing while experiencing social distancing. Uh, this is one of the byproducts of what we are facing now. Point number two, uh, in spite of this division, as we are doing in Europe, within Europe, we have to try hard to work together. We have division in Europe, as you know. We have an important meeting today, the German position, the Dutch position, the Italian position, the French position, are tough and divided, but we are trying, in spite of division, to work together. And we should do the same, try hard, at the G20 level. In 2009, the G20 was able to rise up to the challenge. It was newly created at the head of state level, and it was successful. Uh, and Will we be able to do the same in this crisis? Uh, not much, not so, so far. But again, as in Europe, we have to try hard, to try harder. Point three, on EU-China cooperation. Again, we have to be realistic. Uh, first, everyone in Europe, and especially everyone in Italy, has been deeply grateful for the medical help coming from China. I keep every day a, a video, I have every day a video for the Italian uh, follower of ISPI on coronavirus. And in one of these videos, I told something 
a, about this uh, help from China. And I told my follower that my father generation memory of the end of the Second World War was American soldiers distributing food, silk uh, uh, socks and uh, chewing gum to people in Italy. It, that was the beginning before the Marshall Fund. And during this crisis, an entire generation of young Italian have not seen American distributing food, but Chinese sending medical equipment. And this is something which has an impact. But having said that, this was not only the case of Italy, having said that, it's clear that everybody in Europe hope that masks don't morph into merger and acquisition of our strategic company in the next month, which will be cheap on the market and which uh, would be met by harsh reaction in today's Europe, which is looking at borders, at golden shares. And uh, at the same time, we should expect many industrial sectors trying to secure their supply chain in the next month after having experienced their fragility during this crisis. And this is not necessarily a good news in China-Europe relationship, since how interconnected we are. My hope is that Europe and China will continue, as we are trying to do, to build upon the current cooperation to reinforce the fragile architecture of multilateral governance, as many panelists already mentioned. We had a good experience with climate, we can do more on other areas. My final point, which echoes what Jean Christophe mentioned a few minutes ago, is on multilateralism and international cooperation. It seems incredibly complicated, nearly impossible in this dramatic time. We don't know if it is a war, we don't know if the reference to World War I, World War II is right, it's a dramatic time, for sure. As Jean-Christophe mentioned, wh while it looked impossible uh, to, uh, to achieve international cooperation, we are all aware that the League of Nations, that the United Nations, that Bretton Woods were all created after dramatic times as well. We emerged from those dramatic times fully aware that multilateral cooperation was crucial. Let's hope we have learned the lesson and then we don't need to go through the entire drama to understand again that cooperation is crucial. And on this, this is my last comment, I think that think tanks are crucial in coming up with ideas, proposals, missions. Everything we do on this may look unrealistic now, may look naive, may look out of touch, but if there, if there are no ideas around, big ideas around, stressing that we don't have to make past mistake to understand what is needed, uh, uh, what are we here for? What is our role? Uh, I think this is something we should at least try. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, thank you for your good comments. Uh, really great uh, to hear that. And uh, uh, you, you emphasize the, 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 of course, the multilateral, you know, and also think tank uh, community efforts. I mean, the webinar we're doing now is one of the examples of how, you know, think tank we should really promoting and standing and also come up with great ideas and also recommend to, to, to the international community, our respective government as well. I appreciate uh, you saying that uh, China was uh, 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 offering some help to our European friends, but but also I would like to say thank thank European friends as well, European countries, and also other countries uh, uh, supporting China. When China initially uh, locked down and he, uh, went through the first phase of that, so it's really a mutual support that uh, we we really appreciate that. Uh, so uh, I, I agree with you that multilateralism. You know, we need a we need a, a Britain Woods version two or upgrade of that. How we can get a, 
a new uh, expanded uh, uh, new modern alternatives to cope with future uh, crises like these uh, is extremely important. And uh, thank you again for your for your comments. Uh, now I, I would like to also invite uh, a Chinese uh, scholar to to comment as well. Uh, we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Zhang Daojun. You know he's uh, he's a professor of international political economy at the Peking University and also uh, a CCG and RS senior fellow as well. And he specializes in uh, you know international relation, energy, and uh, advising uh, government as well. And uh, uh, so that uh, we, we we often hear you in, in the Chinese uh, domain. So perhaps uh, <laughs> Professor. Jai, your turn, please. Uh, let's keep it a single minute. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I will try not to repeat what was said, uh, just very quickly. The first point is that we continue to learn about the virus. And one of the things I really think we have not really come to is whether or not we need to have autopsy performed, more of them autopsies, just to learn about the causes. And that needs international cooperation and uh, sharing rather than just the uh, um, genetic sequencing data. Uh, I'll come to that some point later on. And uh, second point is over the uh, medicine. Uh, it was very poorly handled that some of the uh, quality comments coming out of Europe were uh, wrongly, let me emphasize wrongly portrayed in the media as Chinese complaints about interference in China's domestic affairs. There had nothing to do with that sort of interference. Quality is quality. But speaking of which, um, if we move, when we move forward, standards and uh, compatibility of procedural matters in handling the supply uh, either way or both ways of these products is something we need to put on the table rather than saying this is naming China or that's naming someone else. Um, that kind of connectivity has to be there. We may have a next crisis to come from. And by the way, I have something to share with not just you, but the entire audience. This has to do with the point of, about fear of uh, the, uh, uh, just a second, very quickly, okay. Um, if you look at the screen, right, in Europe, you have more and more comments about <clears throat> have uh, been reliant on China and India for production of medicine. But this is, as on the right side, hand side, you can see, fairly recent, coming out of the Food and Drug Administration of the United States. The kind of percentages you often hear are put on the left side. But you have to look more carefully. These are percentage of these manufacturing facilities for all drugs by country of origin, right? That's, uh, you have uh, China 13%, India 18%, altogether is 31, the highest. But you know, sometimes you often forget China and India had huge populations to consume these products too. So what I'm really trying to say is that uh, we, ha we really have to come back and learn, uh, wait, learn more about these details rather than just being um, led by these that sort of simplification in media references. Um, a third point I wanted to uh, that's pick up on is what I just learned from, uh, heard from Justin uh, in Paris, mentioning about these Gavi, CEPI, these uh, alliances in terms of dealing with uh, medical supplies. In addition to that, you have uh, what's called a global influenza surveillance response network that actually goes back to 1952. And you have the Global Outlook uh, Outbreak Alert and the Response Network that was started in the year 2000. We are talking about hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, research institutions, labs, hospitals, professionals in these networks. These should be uh, in uh, stronger, receive a lot more attention when we talk about international cooperation rather than uh, going around the WHO or whether or not Taiwan is a member of the WHO. Taiwan is having every bit of information in that because it's in those two networks. Those two networks are not sovereign, um, based on sovereignty recognition. So that's the third point. Now, fourth point, um, 
we talk about taking responsibilities. We talk about the UN passing resolutions. Look, let's be face it. It's very easy to pass any uh, unbinding, um, non-binding resolution calling for equitable, efficient, timely access to vaccines. But the manufacturers need money. So what China and the EU, if the United States refuses, so be it. So be it. China and the EU, what should we do? We should do two things. One is to encourage our vaccine companies to do uh, patent pooling. With patent pooling, you can bring down the cost of production. And second is to uh, do what's called a procurement pooling, which basically means together we ask you know, African countries, Latin American countries to consider paying. They, they have to pay. It cannot be free. But then, you know, they pay on condition that there is a uh, sovereign guarantor of sorts. We may give some aid, but they have to pay uh, some money. It may not be the, the market level of money. So in addition to that, to the taking care of access of medicine for poor developing countries, lower income countries, it's really, that's the fifth point. Uh, China and Europe should take the lead if we want to demonstrate leadership. It requires joint action to identify those vaccines for international travel. We have to get the planes flying again. Students, businessmen, families, people need to be certified to be safe to fly. The passengers themselves need to say, okay, I'm having something, I take precautionary measures. The airports, the people who meet them should have confidence in saying, well, these people have, you know, taken med vaccines. And one of the uh, roles the WHO has played, World Health Organization, is to identify that kind of list. At this point of the time, the WHO is probably in a bit of a limbo, but we should get the uh, travel act vaccines. So that's the fifth point. Now, the last point, very quickly, is that let's be honest and frank. After SARS, the WHO has been a moving, you know, <laughs> to be a little bit of a political entity in terms the rules for reporting an outlook, an outbreak is, you know, getting decentralized, but nevertheless, it leaves a lot of room for what's good. Hello? No, somebody is talking. No? Um, so we, we need to somehow come back to look at the uh, protocol more strictly, because over if you look at the so-called lessons learned from SARS, is the WHO as an organization pushing the you know professional decision-making responsibilities, pushing the political responsibilities to member states and to the so-called stakeholders, and that's dangerous. It leaves a lot of leeway for, uh, I'm not saying I support the complaints about China, but structurally, I'm basically saying that if we want to be serious, if we don't want to come back to another time of sorrow for ourselves, we have to come, go back to visit, say, what, how we can improve the protocols. If you look at the letters of okay, the, we have the requirements, the Chinese entities followed every word of the letter of WHO guidelines. Let's put it that way. Then, uh, okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dao Jun. And uh, I think you, you, you have made a one good proposal is that I think the, the, the European companies and Chinese, probably we can help uh, on, on African, on all those, uh, you know, particularly the, on, on, the, on the pharmaceutical and the vaccine, you know, that, but you know, really uh, important that we can, we can work together. Uh, it's really great. No, we had we had now we had a friend from uh, from uh, uh, France. We had a friend from uh, Germany and uh, Italy. Now I would like to have a uh, our friend based in the uh, uh, UK, uh, Mr. Alistair Michi, and uh, uh, he's the Secretary General, British East Asia Council, and also uh, Executive Chairman, uh, UK China Business Leaders uh, Confederation, and he also uh, served as a. Uh, uh, <coughs> Previous as the honorary secretary for the 48 group in the in UK. So, so I know UK is really affected uh, heavily also by this pandemic. And we know that Prime Minister and even the, even the Charles, uh, you know, has also been affected. We, 
uh, our hearts goes to out to them. But but what's the uh, what's the uh, situation and what's your view on this uh, topic? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, President Wang. Uh, uh, first, I want to congratulate you and CCG for hosting this virtual seminar. I mean, this kind of cross-border dialogue is hugely important uh, in the midst of this battle to defeat the pandemic. And as a British citizen, I warmly welcome this invitation to share time together with friends from Europe and China. Um, in the midst of this viral crisis, it seems unreal that just a few months ago, the UK and Brexit dominated the headlines here in Europe. And as I'm speaking to you on a CCG platform, well, not surprised that I'm passionate about the benefits to humanity of the process of globalization. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that uh, our, our friends today from other friends from Europe have, have stressed this point as well. My view is that the only way for humanity to tackle global changes like this pandemic crisis and climate change is to collaborate together as one world community. So it's my personal regret that I was amongst just under 50% in the UK that voted against Brexit. And uh, it's uh, given that the unprecedented crisis swirling about us be unwise to speculate what will be the final outcome of Brexit. Uh, Brexit created huge divisions amongst the people of the UK. And in the context of Brexit, it's truly remarkable how the pandemic crisis has been a catalyst to suddenly remove those divisions. At this current time, my observations are that the UK is totally united in the face of the common enemy of the virus. And on the 23rd of March, when the government announced the lockdown of the UK, there was universal acceptance here in the UK. But in the past week, there has been more and more questions about how the UK government is leading the battle against the virus. This led me to research the preparation of the UK for this kind of pandemic crisis. And I was shocked to learn how the UK government knew the facts and the dangers of viral pand pandemics as far back as 2014. In August 2014, the UK government body, Public Health England, published an analysis of the risks to the UK of a pandemic crisis. And on, five, on page five of that report, it stresses, I quote, the prospect of a flu pandemic is one of the highest risks faced by the UK, ensuring the country is fully prepared and able to respond quickly and effectively is a top priority for Public Health England and, of course, for the government. Then in 2016, the UK government carried out an exercise to test the UK preparation for a pandemic. It was called Exercise Cygnus. And the exercise showed that the pandemic would cause the country's health system here in the UK to collapse from lack of resources, with the then chief medical officer at the time stating that a lack of medical ventilators and the logistics of disposable of dead bodies was a serious problem. As of today, April 2020, the full results of the exercise, Cygnus, remain class classified. But leaked reports suggest the exercise Cygnus results were not made public as the facts were so bad about the lack of UK preparation. Now contrast this secrecy in the UK with the almost continuous UK government political leader attacks on the lack of transparency in China. It's, it really is outrageous, the behavior of some of the UK political leaders. As I speak, the media headlines in the UK now have a focus on the lack of preparation of the UK healthcare system. There's clearly a desperate shortage here in the UK of ventilators and protective clothing. I think that when the history of this era for the UK is written, I believe that evidence will emerge 
that the focus of the political leadership in UK on Brexit was a root problem why the UK was not prepared for this pandemic crisis. Now, looking forward, I think there should be deep concern how each nation in Europe is tackling the crisis in different ways. And as uh, some of our other friends today have reflected, there's a vacuum in obvious leadership across Europe, as there is across the world. There's a lack of obvious evidence of nations learning from each other to find the optimal way to win the battle against the pande pandemic. In the UK, there are a few voices yet, there are very few voices yet concerning about the economic damage being caused by the pandemic. My personal view is that in the long run, the economic pain of this pandemic could be far worse than the health torment we're currently experiencing. It should be a deep frustration that the G20 so far has failed to take a strong lead as it did in the financial crisis of 20, 2008. And I'm heartened that many of the speakers this morning are also supporting that view. The G20 is the most obvious forum for gathering global consensus. That consensus is very urgently needed as nations around the world are struggling to find a way to reopen for business. To me, it seems blindingly obvious that the means that, that means massive investments in testing, contact tracing, and all sorts of other measures and equipment. The world is probably not yet at the peak of this unprecedented pandemic battle. As in any war, there's a huge amount of fog and confusion. But whatever happens going forward, there is the most pressing need for unified global leadership. There's still time for that to emerge. The prospect for humanity is truly grim if nations accelerate the trends to blame each other and trade on escalating rises in insults. Okay. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. And uh, 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 you're right. And you mentioned that the, the, there's lacking of uh, world leadership uh, is precisely, I think, the, one of the uh, uh, frequently uh, theme today is that uh, uh, how can we strengthen the G20 coordination and the uh, and global efforts to combat this pandemic. Uh, there's really need, uh, badly need of that. And, uh, and also we may have more countries to, to get more uh, serious uh, in, as time goes by. So, uh, you know, we should really set aside differences and then really work together for the, for the, for the, for the global uh, coordination and leadership. Uh, I, I think we are uh, running a little bit behind schedule and we try to catch up and uh, we will well, we will we, we have uh, another think tank uh, to uh, to share uh, their, their views, a uh, well-known think tank in France. And uh, but then we have we we'll, we still have a lot two business representatives. We 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 have them to talk uh, after that as well. So maybe we'll try to be brief and uh, and we also get some uh, uh, Q and A coming up. And uh, we currently has over three hundred thousand uh, viewers online. Uh, it's it's afternoon. Uh, the first time we tried that in the afternoon. So so it's which I think the number is still going. So perhaps I could invite uh, Francis uh, Nicholas. Uh, she's a senior research fellow and director of the Center for Asia Study, French Institute of International Relations, a well-known um, uh, think tank in France and also a, a European think tank. And also, you have been frequent visit to China, uh, and also have been studying and watching this part of work. So, uh, Francis, your turn, please. Uh, well, thank you, Henry, and uh, Ni Hao, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll stick very strictly to the to topic of the session. So I'll talk about the EU first and the uh, EU-China relations uh, second. So, but as a preliminary remark to be clear, uh, well, given the uh, the serious, seriousness or the depth and uh, spread of the crisis, which is truly global, I agree with with a number of other uh, speakers, that the response should be a global one. So, so this crisis is really an ideal opportunity to enhance international cooperation, be it at the regional or global level. The last time the world was faced with such a global crisis, such a global shock, was 2008, this has been reminded by a number of other people, when the global financial crisis broke out. 
So the G20 emerged at the time as the principal forum for coordinating an international response. We don't see much of that today. This time, the crisis is not man-made. It is like an, a natural disaster. All countries are faced with the same challenge, and there should be no hesitation whatsoever to push for international cooperation. There should be cooperation also at the regional level, within the EU, for instance, as well as between the EU and China in particular. But unfortunately, on these two counts, much remains to be done. And I would uh, counter on this point that has been said by Justin earlier. So let me address these two uh, things or issues in, in turn. First, the EU. Well, there are two distinct, also, all the related uh, levels that need to be distinguished. There is the health crisis, per se, and then there is the resulting economic crisis. On the former, the health crisis, what we have seen are very different approaches taken by different countries, depending to a large extent on their capacity, on their resources. So depending on this, uh, there were more tests in some countries than in others. There was tracing and tracking in some countries, not the adoption in some others. There was full lockdown in some countries and incomplete lockdown in, in others. Different options. Despite these differences, there have been some signs of solidarity. Let's look at the, the half full glass rather than the half empty glass. And these signs of solidarity have been, uh, for instance, exchange of equipment or, uh, in the case of France, some French patients could be sent to German hospitals or Belgian hospitals, for instance, at the time when the French system was really overstretched. So there has been there have been some signs of solidarity. And in the case of France, France never closed its border with Italy, for instance. But beyond this health crisis, there is also an economic crisis. And the, the health crisis was actually quick to be turned into an economic crisis. And on this latter uh, uh, dimension, the European solidarity is really put to the test. We see substantial differences, and actually these differences should not come as a surprise. They are, and they had been already observed in other instances. We all, all always see the thriftier countries, the more rigorous countries in Northern Europe, basically, which are not on the same page with the other countries in Southern Europe, more or less, which are perceived to be less disciplined, less thrifty. And we see this divide in this, in the current crisis, as we have seen this divide in earlier crises. We have seen this crisis, this divide or this rift at the time of the Eurozone, uh, debt crisis. For the time being, there has not been, uh, well, there is no solution which everybody agrees on. Some countries push for uh, corona, bond bar, uh, yeah, corona bonds, or they, they push for uh, pooling uh, the debt. Some countries disagree with this. Right now, uh, if I'm fully informed, there is discussion about the potential response to the economic crisis. And right at the, at the time of we're speaking, uh, there is a meeting in, in Brussels to discuss this uh, this issue. So I don't know exactly what the uh, outcome of the discussion will be, but my take is that we will come up with a solution. There have always been solutions uh, found by the European Union member states. It is very often quite difficult to find these solutions, but we always come up with a solution. And uh, to uh, quote Jean Monnet, one of the uh, e EU founding fathers, Europe will be forged in crisis. This has always been the case, and I hope that this will be again the case in, the, in this uh, coronavirus-induced um, economic crisis. So the, the solution, for, for instance, may be an EU organization system. This is being uh, discussed, and we'll, and we'll see very soon what comes out of the discussion. So my, my re relatively optimistic take on the EU is that in terms of crisis, terms of crisis uh, these times actually provide an opportunity to go to give new momentum to the cooperative uh, uh, spirit that is the very basis of the integration uh, effort.
And so uh, I think that this is uh, precisely what President Macron is advocating, and I do hope that this is what we will see in the coming uh, days. Next, the second point is about the EU-China uh, relation, or France-China relation. So the second point is about e EU-China. There have been positive signs in the in this bilateral relation. EU countries sent medical equipment when China was really in bad shape in uh, at the very early stage of the of the crisis, uh, and there were also expressions of solidarity by various governments uh, in uh, in Europe. More recently, of course, as the epidemic uh, spread to the to the EU. China also sent medical equipment to the to the EU, so there has been reciprocal uh, assistance provided by the, the two parties. However, and this is a big however, unfortunately what we have seen recently are some signs which do not point to the right direction and do not bode well for the future of international cooperation or bilateral cooperation, EU-China. In the past few weeks, what we have heard or seen are some Chinese officials, and to be more precise, ambassadors, who have launched unacceptable and perfectly ill-founded accusations, attacks, on some EU countries' governments, and in particular my own government, denigrating their management of the crisis, and accusing French members of parliament, for instance, of supporting racist comments against the Director General of the WHO. So the objective of these attacks uh, were, most probably, uh, to make China emerge as a role model. But this effort, effort has led them to denigrate countries with which China has maintained for years deep and friendly relations. These attacks have led uh, the French Minister of, uh, for Foreign Affairs to summon the Chinese ambassador to express his disapproval. Mm -hmm. And uh, he stressed uh, that the statements by the Chinese ambassador do not fit the quality of the relationship between the two countries. And I, I think that it is really a yeah, So be it as it may, this kind of behavior does not pave the way for cooperation because it does not create an atmosphere of trust. This is the major issue. And the lack of transparency is another issue which fuels suspicion and again is detrimental to the emergence of trust. Mm -hmm. My take is that China and the EU are to a large extent on the same page, very much so than with the US, for instance. So this crisis would be an ideal opportunity for the two partners to cooperate, to push international cooperation, to push for some kind of new form of multilateralism, mm -hmm. the, as the one advocated by, by Justin, the vertical multilateralism, for instance. This is also what President Macron has been advocating in the interview he gave to the Financial Times, some reshaping of multilateralism. It is an ideal opportunity for the two parties to do so. And it is very unfortunate that we do not see exactly the right signals being sent on the, on one, by one party. I do hope that the two parties will be up to the task, and I do hope that these were just minor mistakes that would not be reproduced. Thank you. Okay, 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 thank you. And uh, we are really <laughs> running out of time. And uh, I know that uh, 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 the Paulo will, will, will leave at uh, you know, an hour and a half. So pro probably we'll try to have the other two uh, uh, panelists uh, s s you know, finish within the next 10 minutes. And then we will start, we we'll maybe let the Paulo uh, say a few words before he leaves. Uh, so we, now we, we, this time we have also the business uh, uh, representative uh, uh, to join us as well. And uh, uh, because this is really a very important uh, event that China European has a lot of business relation, and then we see that this kind of coronavirus is fact in the business uh, in, uh, uh, as well. EU has a lot of company uh, doing business in China. So I would like to invite uh, Ms. Sarah uh, Machata, uh, State Representative of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China, to, to share uh, uh, your thought you know, maybe briefly. Thank you. Good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for this invitation, Harry and CCG. Uh, the European Chamber of Commerce in China um, represents uh, European companies that have done investments and are into the Chinese market. 
so obviously for us, uh, this is quite a complicated time as we are dealing with uh, China coming back to work and Europe uh, slowly stopping uh, that. What we have done uh, in contact with our members, we have more or less 100, um, 1,700 members, is to launch a campaign last week, which is called We Are In This Together, because being here, we 100% understand the need of cooperation between uh, Chinese and European companies and people for the business come back. I have to say that the sentiments of European companies that are in China uh, is quite good. So we do not expect any mass outflow of uh, investment. The recovery of reproduction out of manufacturing in China has been very swift, very fast. Obviously, now we have two problems, which are basically caused by the pandemic uh, uh, in other countries. The first one is the fact that we expect to have a very weak demand uh, for export, ex export from China on one side, and we have uh, supply chain issues because some of the key parts uh, of the production that actually European companies are carrying out in China still come from Europe or from outside China. Obviously, most of our members are in China to produce for the local market. So the people who have a local supply chain are in fact uh, uh, quite happy of how things are, are, are going at this moment. Um, I think that one of the issues that will have to be resolved internationally and very quickly is the mobility of people, though. Uh, currently, uh, we have a situation in which our managers are prevented to come into China, even if they have visas or they are residents here. So uh, uh, our invested companies most of the times would have issues uh, because their foreign management is blocked in Europe and they can come back. This on one side. On the other side, um, uh, there is obviously in, in the business world, and we're not talking just about cross or the uh, m and We're talking about projects that need people, that need people to travel into Europe and into China. We're talking about uh, 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 experts, we're talking about technicians, we're talking about inspectors that need to travel. And obviously we have all this, uh, let's say, uh, very practical issues that we see affecting the, 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 the business comeback of our members uh, into China. Um, I think that um, in this, uh, climate, what was extremely well welcomed by our members was the call that Vice Premier Luha made last Friday with uh, the EU Executive Vice President Dubrovsky in connection with uh, what is going to happen uh, to the uh, bilateral investment treaty that was under discussion that has been under discussion for a few years, actually. Um, in fact, we call it comprehensive agreement on investment uh, because the content of that treaty is going to be uh, much more ambitious than uh, a bilateral investment treaty, a traditional one. So it will cover the traditional and classical content of a bilateral investment treaty with investment protections. But we are looking also uh, at the part that deals with market access issues. Obviously, within the WTO un um, undertakings uh, and probably not covering uh, one of the issues that uh, have been uh, 
that raised in the past few years, which is connected to the to the public procurement. But it's going to be a very ambitious agreement. Uh, unfortunate talks have been very slow. And uh, since the beginning of the year, uh, a number of preparatory events uh, of the formal talks have actually been cancelled. We didn't have the meeting for the high-level economic dialogue between the EU and China. We didn't have the political summit that is usually connected to a business summit, uh, which was scheduled for, for, for spring. Uh, so we hope that the talk between Liu He and Dobromsky will lead to um, a refocusing okay. of China on EU after phase one was concluded with the US. Okay. Uh, and and, and mm, I mean, the current commitment is, is to finalize the treaty uh, by the end of the year, but it, it might be complicated to do that. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We, we're really uh, at the height now. And uh, I, I would like to have uh, 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 our Chinese uh, uh, business representative, uh, Mr. Wing Hao, to, to give a, uh, a brief comment as well. And uh, before we get into the Q&A. <coughs> So, Ling Hao, can you hear me? He's the founder, chairman of CEO Nanjing Earth House Electric uh, Limit, you know, Limited, a business representative. Hello. Good afternoon, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a really very crisis time, and everyone think we have to work together to overcome this crisis uh, problem. Our company East House is doing the high security business. Uh, we have customers from about 40 countries in the US and the Europe. We have our own companies also. Uh, I think COVID-19 in US is very serious, but our business there is still going up. Our business in Europe is moving a little bit slow, I think, but it's still running. Most of our customers in Europe are still working daily now. Uh, the, epidemic, uh, the epidemic has affected our business series, not very seriously, I think. The situation for other companies may be different because we do the security uh, product. So it's a Bit different customers very frequently, and we see they begin to attention the supply chains, but they still continue the global supply. They purchase from us, they also want to have safety stock. So I think now the globalization is always needed to reduce the operation costs and to get better products from the enterprise. It's not big issues, I think. I think this disease will eventually left just like the fluent in 1918. It's really very, very big issues at that time. The COVID-19 will not affect the business in a long time, I think. The outlook of the, uh, China and the EU relationship is bright. The crisis uh, will ev eventually pass soon, I think. China-EU cooperation will be more closer. China has huge market and great supply chain and more and more R&D technicians now. In the other hand, RCEP is reaching its final state stage. It covered the market over 60 of the world's population. So to invest in China means getting to the largest market in the world. EU also is a big market with over 440 million populations. The education and the R&D, the labor is high qualified. So all of those attract the investment from China. Mm -hmm. We can expect the, the, the bright potentials in the future, I think. 
So uh, in my opinion, I think the globalization has a problem in the future. Thank you for everyone. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Yeah. Minghao. And uh, so, so we actually, uh, uh, you know, finished our, 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 our you know, overview uh, assessment of by our, each of our panelists. <clears throat> we have some questions here uh, collected, but uh, I know that uh, yeah. Uh, Paulo is uh, is uh, is had to leave soon, but uh, you know I would like to you know have your uh, concluding remark after uh, all the uh, exchanges we had among our panelists. Maybe we'll uh, let you speak first. Yeah. Thank you, uh, yeah. Wang. I, I I don't dare to to have concluding remarks after such a, an interesting debate. Uh, I, I simply try to uh, to share what. We, what emerged in common, uh, we are fully, all of us, we are fully aware that it's going to be very difficult. We don't know if the word war is correct, but uh, it's going to be very difficult um, from the health point of view, from the economic point of view, and in many countries from the social point of view. Angela Merkel just uh, uh, said in a speech that this coronavirus will be a threat to democracy. So we are getting to the political system also, because you know, we all know that in all countries, as in Great Britain, at the beginning, the crisis unifies, as uh, Alistair mentioned. But after a war, there is always a Norimberga, Nürnberg. And this is the time where division will be much stronger than before. And so this is where the, the crisis will move from the health level to the economic level, to the social level, and then to the political level. So we are all aware of this. And we all mentioned that the goal is to go back to cooperation. And we all mentioned that it could look like wishful thinking like a dream but we think tanker have to be dreamer have to work on dream and someone sometimes will pick up the dream and we will not do our job if we don't insist within our country with the public opinion and abroad in exercises like the one you did today one thank you again okay stressing the dreams and the necessity yeah. thank you thank you thank you paulo for for your for your uh, you know final remark i think that's uh, that's exactly uh, the the spirit of our uh, webinar is about uh, we want to hold uh, you know uh, our international at least think tank community together and the business community together and we really uh, promoting the uh, the mutual understanding uh, better mutual understanding and also how we can better uh, uh, safeguard the multilateralism in fighting the uh, uh, COVID-19. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to report now. We 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 we, we in the last uh, next uh, uh, in the, uh, 20 minutes maybe we'll conclude our our uh, seminar today. Uh, we actually had a lot of uh, questions uh, from uh, correspondent and also uh, viewers online. We had about 400,000 now uh, viewers uh, currently uh, on Baidu.com. So it's quite I mean, could, we have also had some other portals as well. So we probably closed half a million people view us online. Uh, we ha I have a few questions, and uh, there's one from uh, China Business Network. Uh, how does COVID-19 crisis impact on the solidarity of EU? And also, uh, the, the CBN was asking, how uh, many European countries have uh, tightened their rules uh, for foreign investors? Uh, so what's your opinion on this trend, and what impact will there be on China and EU? Uh, um, uh, cooperation. There's another question from uh, the paper, which is a journal media based in Shanghai, and uh, basically saying that uh, we are now witness a uh, sharp contrast between Chinese and European media coverage of the pandemic. So the same phenomena sometimes can be interpreted uh, differently, and uh, or even maybe different narratives. So how we can uh, better uh, uh, coming up with the ideas to uh, to, to reduce this gap of the two uh, public opinions on both sides. And also, uh, there's uh, internet viewers also asking uh, 
um, uh, for Justin that uh, uh, Justin mentioned about the importance of collective response and also for this international crisis and also the uh, uh, vertical multi multilateralism. And uh, but then there is also uh, strong uh, forces against the multilateralism. Uh, uh, so how we can uh, better uh, cope with that? Uh, uh, to, to further strengthen the global governance, uh, particularly for this uh, pandemic uh, uh, you know, crisis. And uh, we also have people uh, asking, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a, a considerable pessimistic uh, sentiment about the globalization. So do you think that the globalization uh, uh, process will be uh, 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 reversible, or, or if uh, if uh, if not, uh, what what would be the confidence to, to promote that further? So I think we had a, a you know a, a sample of the question like that. But I think uh, in our uh, final uh, episode, I would really hope that uh, uh, you know we have uh, each of you give maybe two or three minutes of uh, of a concluding remark, and uh, I would like to start with uh, adjusting as well. I mean, you are also. Uh, I mean, before you join the Paris Peace Forum, you were the director for the policy department of the French Minister of Foreign Affairs. So you, you from, from both think tank and government, you have a very good uh, perspective on that. So perhaps, uh, Justin, you can give your uh, final comment. Thank you, Henry. Lots of interesting uh, things have been said. Um, Yes, I am uh, no longer working at the uh, French uh, uh, Foreign Ministry. I wanted to, to mention that because um, Jean-Christophe... That was the last job. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yes, exactly. I alluded uh, to that. However, uh, I can only support what uh, Françoise Nicolas said uh, uh, earlier. First, on her uh, optimism on the EU response. I mean, take any crisis that has happened to the EU uh, in the last... 30 years, whether it's the, the, the war in the Balkans, or uh, it's the uh, crisis of 2007, or it's the uh, refugee crisis, or it's the Greek slash Euro crisis, each time uh, you have uh, the same very pessimistic take. When I was in Washington uh, at Brookings, and it was uh, uh, with you, uh, Henry, um, uh, uh, all I was uh, uh, hearing was that the EU would break down and would, would disappear. And it did not happen. It did not happen for a simple reason, which is that the reasons for sticking together, the political reasons are stronger than uh, the uh, divisions brought by economic and financial issues, uh, etc. And so if you look closely, the first response is always a disaster. And then uh, the EU gets its uh, acts uh, together. Um, quickly on vertical multilateralism. So let me... Uh, 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 just be specific, and I don't want to go into too much jargon, but basically, not only we need multilateralism, that is to say, countries cooperating among themselves, but we also need other actors. And the examples I was giving from Gavi, uh, CEPI, Unitaid, and, and Global Fund, they all associate governments with private companies, with foundations like the Gates Foundation or the Aga Khan Development Network and others, uh, and that's what is really uh, effective. And we do need uh, to do more, especially for Africa. And these, uh, uh, let's say we can call it polylateralism, if you'd like. Uh, but once again, I'm not a fan of jargon, but they are needed uh, to bring the uh, adequate response. Uh, the, the question on, on reducing the gap in public opinion seems to me really important because I al also agree with what Françoise Nicolas said earlier. I'm a great supporter of better uh, EU-China relations, I do think it's really important. I'm also an admirer uh, of the abilities um, of, the, uh, of China in many domains, but communication is not one of them. And what we've seen in the recent weeks and months, uh, I'm sorry to say, was a disaster in terms of how you handle communication, uh, because what she said was, uh, was, was true. And uh, for example, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, some people in, in retirement homes, some workers, uh, secluded themselves with the uh, aged people, with the um, uh, uh, older uh, people, in order not to contaminate the retirement home. There were several examples of that in France. And what we uh, saw, not in some obscure website or conspiracy, conspiracy theory uh, website, but on the website of the embassy, of the, on the official website, was a smear that workers had abandoned uh, uh, older people in retirement homes. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't add anything. It doesn't make China look better, but it sort of angers 
uh, the population at a time of crisis when nerves are really very, very sensitive. And so uh, if I had a plea to make, it would be that in the interest of good uh, EU-China relations, uh, we both make uh, a, an effort at toning down uh, the uh, uh, rhetoric, uh, the battle of narratives, and we sort of get back to what is really happening, which is, uh, which is you know, little by little better cooperation uh, between uh, between China uh, and the EU. We are, I think, we are finding ways to cooperate better, and that in turn, to answer the question, that in turn will reduce the gap in public opinions. Not, I would say, uh, you know, um, uh, bad public relations, bad um, uh, public policies or bad uh, pronouncement, uh, including by, by officials, that doesn't work. And that actually works uh, in, in, in reverse. Very last point, I'm not afraid about deglobalization. I don't think that would really happen. But obviously, we will see an acceleration of a trend that pre-existed, which is a trend towards the deceleration, so the slowing down of globalization. I mean, uh, uh, you know, travel by uh, uh, a plane and the internet and exchange of data will not uh, will not uh, uh, disappear. They will slow down. They might decrease for a time, but I don't see a, a reversal of globalization. And so the only the only conclusion, the only logical conclusion, is we need more cooperation, especially uh, uh, between uh, China and the EU. And I'll stop here. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Justin. I think you. You said very well. I mean, particularly on the vertical globalization, it's it's not just government, but also other sectors, uh, other players can um, put in. I, I think it's uh, you know it's important that also we promote a mutual understanding and a better narrative and better communication. Uh, absolutely, that's important. I think uh, we we all agree with that to try to have a better understanding to uh, communicate better uh, for for both EU and China. Uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, you know, we are we are running out of time, so maybe uh, two or three minutes each, and we will have uh, uh, Professor Trey, uh, your, your final comments and uh, uh, feedback and uh, questions as well. Professor Hongjian, yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. And uh, I think, that firstly, I think it's just a, a very, uh, you know, beginning and starting point for all this uh, discussion. Hopefully, we can have uh, another opportunity to depend some, uh, you know, discussion, because we got a lot of uh, very interesting uh, points from my uh, colleagues, especially from the uh, European side. I just give some uh, very briefly, uh, you know, uh, points. Firstly, regarding to the scenario of the, uh, you know, value chain, supply chain, and also uh, uh, everything, especially in the background of the uh, debate between the globalization, insisting globalization or deglobalization. I think that uh, maybe we could not go back to the past uh, totally, especially uh, we need to try to find out a new way to push forward the so-called globalization. And then now, especially more and more countries, especially from the European side, they will take more consideration about the security, especially the safety of the uh, supply chain. So I think that now, maybe uh, in future, there will be a, a new mixture between, uh, between a kind of uh, originalization of uh, industry and also uh, further globalization of uh, industry, because I think it would be a very, I mean, a reasonable choice, not only for uh, European countries and even for China or some other, uh, you know, uh, 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 economic uh, ec uh, economies. And of course, uh, the secondly is, how could we deal with some issue of the communication and also uh, even some, uh, uh, you know, perception, anything. So I think, firstly, we need to find out the, which kind of, uh, uh, you know, the behaviors uh, which kind of behaviors would be just a technical issue. And it's maybe some other will be a, a political or some other. So I think we should be more cautious to uh, you know, avoid any kind of uh, politicalization for some any uh, technical issues. Uh, just to give you an example is, you know, uh, two days ago, uh, the Canada government, especially the prime minister of Canada, uh, claimed that, okay, we, we have two uh, airplanes uh, go back uh, from China to uh, uh, Canada without any equipment, uh, medical equipment inside. Of course, once you just give some uh, politicalization uh, uh, explanation, it will be very, very, uh, uh, you know, big problem uh, between China and Canada. But if we go back to a technical level, we can understand, yes, now uh, China has a lot of uh, 
problem to deal with the transportation between the factory uh, to the airport. And, you know, now there are so many airplanes uh, are waiting for the, uh, you know, uh, equipment in Chinese air, uh, uh, airport. So we can say it's just a technical issue. It's, it could not be a, a political issue. And the third is, I agree with our uh, colleagues from Europe that in the face of the uh, uh, epidemic, uh, every country and even everybody, we did something wrong at the very beginning, even for China, you know? So I think now uh, chi Chinese attitude is very clear that uh, we should, now we should rethink uh, what we did and we should find out the, uh, you know, uh, the gap between our, you know, a goal and also our practice. And how could we try find out a more, uh, you know, practical uh, uh, solution to deal with this uh, uh, gap between the capability and the willingness? I think the same, same case happened in European side, especially on the competence of the European Union. Uh, once there will be more competence uh, by European Union on, you know, public health care, I think there will be more, uh, you know, uh, 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 how to say, there will be better uh, response from the European Union side on this uh, uh, crisis. And uh, finally, is yes, I think that for Chinese uh, uh, communication uh, with European side, with the uh, international community, we should try, we should try to find a more uh, constructive way, especially to take care, um, uh, maybe in a way of um, with more dissent uh, and also gentle and uh, in a more acceptable way, especially uh, to understand what's the real, just like uh, uh, our European friends mentioned, especially in a very sensitive uh, uh, time for people. So I think we need to do uh, a lot. But of course, before that, as the think tank, we need to talk and uh, uh, discuss and also thinking a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Hong Jian. And uh, that's right, we, we need to talk and we need a dialogue. And, and also we need to really find a better way to uh, explain and uh, communicate. Uh, I, I would like to also have uh, Alice there, uh, uh, also your final comment, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Wang Piao. Um, I, I think I'd like to strongly support one of the messages that come out today. Uh, and this has come out from other CCG uh, 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 forums that I've attended. Governments, are desperately in need of new ideas to tackle the unprecedented crisis that we're in. So uh, think tanks have a hugely important role to come up with new ideas. And one of those areas I, I particularly feel strongly is the gap in communications that one of uh, the questions came up, that the difference in public opinion. There's a huge gap in understanding um, uh, between Europe and China. Um, and I think there's a, an urgent need for, for sort of uh, thinking within pop, uh, 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 think tanks here to, to come up with deeper under cross-border understanding of how uh, different nations, different parts of the world, different civilizations communicate. I mean, many of you are, are familiar with China and China communicates in a very different way with a directed message uh, than uh, uh, elsewhere in the world. As those of us that live in Europe and the USA uh, know that the persuasion is the core to communication. And this gap in communication styles causes huge amounts of uh, problems, misunderstanding um, uh, in, in, in the world today. So I think there's a, a very, very urgent need for some really radical new thinking. How do we get communication and passage of information that's accurate uh, between different nations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Th thank you. Yes, uh, I agree. I think communication is the key and uh, we ought to do better. I mean, uh, of course, uh, uh, China uh, has done a lot of things uh, right, but then uh, if, uh, if, uh, if we don't communicate well, then uh, certainly uh, that will impact uh, uh, in, uh, influence, uh, the in effectiveness of that. So I, I agree that we all should uh, have a better communication, but also, uh, uh, you know, I, we we really hope that there will be more people uh, in the future come to China and see and believe in, and uh, and then see how the system is is working. And for example, this uh, coronavirus, we had uh, 
uh, you know, China has basically quickly, uh, you know, locked down a 10 million city, a 50 million province, 6 million province, and has uh, experienced many uh, new way of uh, comeback in this virus. And then, uh, so that uh, has relatively successfully contained. So, so it's a contribution, I think, also that uh, China has made. And uh, uh, so that uh, that can be in the future can be shared. And also China should do all it can to help uh, other countries as well. I, I think you know, it should be mutually uh, beneficial to all the countries. Uh, 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 also, uh, so Francis, uh, we'll have your brief comment uh, <laughs> as well. No, sorry, I would like to have uh, Dr. Zhang Daojun, maybe <laughs> another yeah, Chinese. I one. wanted to say something. I felt very strongly having yeah, heard yeah. what uh, Francois and uh, Justin said about those messages linked to the Chinese embassy website. That's extremely unfortunate and unappropriate. Our diplomats need to do a much better job. In addition to that, we also have some of these officially sponsored websites here in China, Xinhua News or People's Daily, that you know they have links to some of the messages that really don't represent, uh, don't portray China in a positive image. But it is also true, on the other hand, here in China, you don't really have a unified Chinese point of view. Just one quick example, looking, uh, well, looking was the, was the coffee company that went to New York Stock Exchange and they did, you know, questionable accounting. And although it was admitted as a uh, prior to discipline by the Stock Security Exchange Commission of the United States, Chinese commentary was overwhelmingly critical of the way this company handled that. So what I'm really trying to say is that we live in the media world whereby words of negativity travel far faster than words of uh, positive sentiments. But uh, those issues need to be dealt with. But I also would urge you to think that uh, if we have more of these kind of conversations later on, is that uh, here in China, not just people like us who can speak a foreign language, we need a far better understanding of the different news outlets in Europe, in the United States, elsewhere, what backgrounds they were, right? What they say about China, what kind of opinions they represent, and you know what you guys mean, what you folks mean by left and right or extremism. We should not mistaken that for representing a French, a German, or European view. And likewise, um, those views from China earlier, as I said, that. Uh, our government approved government run news agencies need to be far more careful and our foreign ministries including you know research think government affiliated research think tanks they need to be far more careful in uh, allowing the links to those kind of stories but mm -hmm. it's not just a matter of communication i would think it's a matter of learning about the larger background of those uh, where these messages of even of hatred the messages of xenophobia there is a larger background to that rather than saying this is the thing that represents the government of uh, or mm -hmm. a people and what sarah said really uh, struck in my head if we don't deal with these kind of um, uh, messages of negativism then um, inevitably it affects you know decisions to open the borders and allow people to travel it will have negative impacts on those long-running projects like uh, investment treaties that ought to be done. Mm -hmm. That's what I was, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor Jia. Uh, Francis, maybe briefly, uh, we're, we're coming to the end, yes. Yes, two, two very quick points. Uh, the first one about the c communication gaps. Uh, I fully agree that there is something that needs to be done on, the, on this issue, but I don't want to sound too negative, but the problem is that on top of the communication gap, you also have definition gaps. And sometimes we use the same words, meaning very different things. So definition gaps are a huge issue on top of the communication gap. So I don't want to sound negative, but this is a top, top job. Okay. Second point is about the reversal, globalization reversal. But I don't think that we'll be seeing a globalization reversal. What we will be seeing is simply a confirmation of a pre-existing trend, 
as uh, Justin rightly said before. And we should not forget that the world existed before the coronavirus crisis. And there were trends already underway. And these trends underway will be simply confirmed. And we should not think you know, that all of a sudden the world is, will change with the coronavirus. There have been changes ongoing. These will be confirmed. And for instance, I guess that the globalization had probably gone too far. There was too much fragmentation, segmentation in the value of, in the value chains. There had already been some kind of backtracking on this point, and this will simply be confirmed after the coronavirus uh, crisis. But everything will not be triggered by this coronavirus uh, crisis. I think we should not over uh, interpret the impact of the coronavirus uh, crisis. It is bad. It is bad. It is deep. It is everything we have, everybody said before. But you know there are already yeah already trends ongoing and they will simply accelerate or be confirmed. That's what I'm going to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Francis. We have another Chinese friend, uh, Ming Hao, please, briefly. Yes. You're concluding, Ming Hao. Yes. I think the um, argument only between the politicians because they. They care the vote, and the business is business. Uh, we have a um, lot of uh, webinars with our customers around the world. We never argue. We just talk about how to do more business between together. So I think it's not a big problem for just like the globalization. It's it's not issue for the future. okay. Yeah. Yeah, great. That's right. That's right. You you talk about the business yeah. uh, really is the the most important connection that we have. In yeah, this, business is business. It is driven by the, uh, profit. Okay. It's not driven by politics. Okay, great. Okay, that's your great comment. And uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Sarah uh, Machata, please. You're from the EU Chamber. Also uh, have a conference with our customers in US. Okay, we have a final word from Sarah Machata, please. Um, uh, just a couple of points on uh, investment screening and foreign direct investment in Europe. Obviously, in a time of crisis, you can expect that those investment screening rules are going to be uh, upgraded. Uh, However, the situation is very patchy in Europe because there is only one information and recommendation procedure that is on for the whole Europe and each of the country has a different, uh, uh, let's say, approach to golden powers, golden shares and so on. Some they have, some they don't and, and so on. Uh, uh, secondly, I think that uh, not necessarily the, the trends that were on before the pandemic are going to to expand uh, uh, necessarily in the same way. I think that the business world looks at this as a restart. And when you restart, you want to do things better. Uh, so I would not say that uh, in, the, in, in, in the medium run, the business world, we just get more detached, uh, 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 or uh, more complicated uh, um, by 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 the pandemic, and, and and speaking about the EU and China, I think that we have a very great possibility of of cooperation, which is on sustainability, on avoiding the next big uh, uh, world uh, crisis, which is going probably to be something that is uh, related to the climate, uh, something that is related to all the policies that Europe has started, uh, with the, uh, with the Green Deal. So that would be an occasion that I think that Europe, China need to take uh, care of uh, because uh, it's, it's, it's a very unique, uh, time to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Actually, uh, both both Ming Hao and you has an answered the, the question I just got from CNBC. Uh, to basically, to talk about the business environment, how that business will be uh, China and the EU, how that will be continued. I think you both of you has mentioned the business is is, is very very important uh, for for both EU and China. 
so I think today we have actually uh, going to come to the close now of our, our special webinar on uh, you know, uh, EU, China, and also how uh, how we can fight with uh, uh, you know coronavirus. And uh, uh, this is really a great uh, uh, seminar, and I really think that we have covered many issues. We covered uh, uh, you know multilateralism, we covered the global governance, we covered uh, you know EU-China relations, we covered the you know how we can do better communication. We covered about business, how we can still you know be tightly connected, and how we can overcome all those difficult together. So this is really a great. I think uh, CCG is really. Uh, putting up this platform and uh, uh, you know bridge the the, the differences, trying to uh, uh, improve the understanding and the communication, and also to collect uh, good ideas and good thinking uh, from all of you, and uh, and then we we can really uh, do a good summary, and then also uh, to to digest and also to uh, uh, you know share with uh, relevant uh, uh, authorities as well, so that we can uh, have a better policy making, particularly for international. Uh, relations and global uh, exchanges. So this is really a great uh, uh, exchanges. And uh, uh, on behalf of CCG, I would like to thank all of you uh, very much. And uh, also want to thank, uh, we have now almost over 700,000 uh, uh, viewers now, according to the Baidu.com uh, portal and other portals combined. And uh, I want to thank all, all of them watching in China and internationally. And uh, so this is a great uh, exchange and uh, uh, we hope that we'll continue in the future. Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, all the panelists, distinguished panelists very much. And also I want to thank the viewers and uh, our, our media friends and uh, uh, to watch this. So we will we'll, uh, we'll leave today and uh, we hope we'll continue. And I hope that uh, uh, EU and China and, uh, and also the rest of the world, we can really uh, work together and then to really uh, contain and uh, uh, in fighting this uh, uh, coronavirus and I hope that uh, we have a, a good uh, uh, you know, more better communications and understanding in future. Thank you very much. So we'll conclude today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye.